Welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Melanie McKinney, Programs Coordinator for Can Do Multiple Sclerosis. Thank you for acting on the belief that you are more than your MS by attending tonight's webinar, Traveling with MS, with Can Do Programs Consultants, Linda Walls, Occupational Therapist, and Mandy Rorig, Physical Therapist. Before starting tonight's presentation, I'd like to talk a little about Can Do Multiple Sclerosis. Can Do MS is an innovative provider of lifestyle empowerment programs for people living with MS and their support partners. We are the start of a whole new way of thinking about and living with MS. Can Do MS empowers people to move beyond their MS by giving them the knowledge, skills, tools, and confidence to adopt healthy li lifestyle behaviors, actively co-manage their disease, and live their best lives. In 2010, CanDo MS launched its new website, www.mscando.org. Please visit the website where you can register for upcoming webinars, listen to archived webinars, check out our CanDo MS Lifestyle Empowerment programs, including our CanDo four-day programs and Jumpstart one-day programs. You can share your CanDo promise and also learn ways you can contribute to or get involved with CanDo MS. A few items before we get started this evening. Our presenters will address questions and comments at the end of the presentation, and we certainly encourage questions and comments throughout the presentation. You can post your question by typing in the chat feature, which is located at the left of your computer screen. To submit a question, type in the small box that says Chat with Presenters. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived on CanDoMS's website. You are more than welcome to view the presentation again, and if you've missed one of our other webinars, you can find the archived version on our website. And for those of you who are joining us live tonight, you will receive an email with copies of the PowerPoint presentation. And new in 2001, you can listen to the live webinar through your computer speakers rather than having to call in. So your job tonight as live participants is to one, submit your questions and comments in the chat box, Two, complete the evaluation at the end of the webinar. And three, review the webinar schedule and register for the upcoming webinars. And we have two wonderful speakers lined up for you this evening. Uh, first is Linda Walls. Linda has been a practicing occupational therapist for approximately 25 years, the majority of those years at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Her experience has been in many areas, including neurology, neurosurgery, trauma, and inpatient rehabilitation units. And recently, she has been working with children who have fine motor coordination and visual perceptual difficulties. And we also have Mandy Rorig with us, physical therapist, and she graduated from Nebraska Wesleyan University with her bachelor's, and she received her doctorate of physical therapy from the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha. She is a member of the American Physical Therapy Association's neurological section, and she's also actively involved in the MS community in the Omaha area, and she serves on a committee for the National MS Society's Professional Resource Center. So before we get started this evening, we'd like to know a little bit more about you. Uh, so if you can um, answer the question here on this quick survey, we'd like to know if you are a person living with MS, support partner, healthcare professional, or if you fall into another category. And uh, it looks like the vast majority are individuals who are living with MS. And we have a few support partners too, which is fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over the uh, slide deck to Mandy and to Linda. Thanks so much. Hello, and welcome to the presentation. Um, this is Linda Walls. I will begin. Um, we're going to start with just some pictures to give you an idea of the direction we're going to go with our talk. We're going to encourage you to go out um, and travel. Traveling um, has lots of opportunities out there, and our goal is to help you understand that there are so many places to see, things to experience, sounds to hear. We want to be we are going to make our best effort to answer your questions about the what about um, that may be stopping you from traveling, and then offering you the encouragement to enrich your life by traveling. Um, let's first give you um, take time to think a few minutes 
um, about your personal I- needs and your ideas and reasons that you might want to travel. And some of the suggestions I have is the reasons traveling is such a wonderful opportunity is it gives us an opportunity to go out for enjoyment. It can offer educational experiences. It can provide time for family time, for a couple's time. Um, and I'm sure that each one of you can also come up with other reasons that you want to have uh, travel to be more in your, involved in your life. So we're going to begin by talking about the fact that planning for your travel is hopefully going to equal success with your travel. Our goal is to help you answer the questions which will guide you forward and encourage your travels. We're going to focus on three main areas, the where, the how, and the what. To begin, the definition of travel is to go from one place to another, but where do you want to go? So to begin, we're going to, I'm, the questions I have for you is, what are your interests? Um, is it adventure? Are you looking for history and seeing, um, experiencing that? Is it to visit family? Is it to visit friends? Or is it just to get away from it all and to relax? Where? When w- people talk about traveling and getting started with their first experience, one of the first things I want to um, suggest is to start close to home. This helps you to build your confidence. As you define your needs, your goals, you can build your travel plans. So an example would be to go away possibly just for the weekend so that you have some experience with the travel component, the actual ability to um, experience the visiting, the adventure on a small scale, and then again the travels back home. And then when the weekend is over, you can reflect on how that affected your energy levels, what components um, you know, were challenging for you, and um, this will help you then kind of start to define your needs as you move forward in planning uh, tra- a traveling experience. Um, where, where can also be defined as um, how long. So as I mentioned, you might want to start with a weekend, Um, Then you also want to think about your pace, your activity level. Do you need um, to allow time to do the actual traveling and then the activity itself? For instance, you know, one day for the airline travel um, and then a day, the next day, actually start um, being able to participate in an activity with your family or friends. Along that same line, you want to be able to evaluate yourself and say, what is a comfortable activity level for me? What works for me? Do I need to provide myself with a walker that I don't normally use or a scooter that maybe I don't use every day, but if I'm out and about, that might really help me? A wheelchair. Again, anything to help keep you actively involved. Um, then you want to think about where you're going. Again, whether you need that wheelchair or not might depend on whether this place offers you opportunities to stop and rest, um, opportunities to go back and relax. Um, All these are factors that will influence your ability to answer your question, where am I going and where where would I like to travel to? Um, Remember to include the longer the distance, the more time you want to allow for you to enjoy that experience because we don't want um, any one part to over, overwhelm you so that you can't actually experience the visit or the, um, the opportunity to learn if the actual train ride or plane ride is exhausting. As I continue to address where, there's other questions you might have, things that you might want to consider, such as the temperature. Will it be hot there? Will it be cold? How does the hot or the cold impact your energy levels? You and your family, um, you want to look at your schedule, your family's schedule, and look at when it's easier for you, everybody to get away so that they're 
these are all factors so that you can minimize the stress. If you reduce the stress, then there's a better chance that you can relax and enjoy your travel plans. You also want to think about where you're going. When you think of um, some places, they might be more crowded in the summer. Um, when it's hotter, it, if it's more crowded, then it may take longer. You might have to experience lines. These are all things um, that you want to think about as you um, address your questions of, of where am I going and what, um, when should I go. The next thing I would like to do is offer you some resources because obviously when you're trying to figure out where you want to go, the more information you gather, the more chance of having a successful um, a, a travel experience. So one of the things would be to look at some of the books out there. There are two right here pictured, two books that are specifically um, for traveling with somebody who, for a traveler with disabilities. And both of these books have been given um, high rec um, recommendations and might, if nothing else, you might want to look through them because they'll give you wonderful ideas. On that same note, here are several websites. Again, a lot of the websites have lots of experiences, people with MS, um, their suggestions, their recommendations. Um, and you might want to explore each one of these as you slowly define where you're going and start answering some of those uh, first questions that you have. So you want to make sure um, you, know, you, you look at all your sources. Next, the next slide, um, the next area we're going to talk about is the how. How will you travel? What method of transportation will meet your need, your schedule, and your interests? How much time do you have? Do you enjoy the traveling part of your trip? These are all questions to consider as you try to decide on how you will travel. Then um, as we move forward, we're going to go into four main areas the airplane as our mode of travel, cars and RVs, trains or buses, and boats as in cruises. Great. Thanks, Linda. Uh -huh. We'll move on with air travel. Some general recommendations that we'll start with when you travel by airplane. Request wheelchair assistance, and that means when you're booking the flight, when you're checking in, also be sure to indicate that you may need that in a connecting destination as well. General recommendations again, carry-on luggage. Um, we are limited nowadays with the amount of carry-on luggage that we can have and also with the amount of check-in luggage that we can have. So being organized and making certain that you have the essentials available to you when you need it is, is a priority. So medications is something that we recommend to have in your carry-on luggage with a physician letter. Have an extra change of clothes in case of any type of incident that may occur, whether it be a layover that requires you to spend the night uh, or lost luggage. And then also a high priority is to request an aisle seat for ease of bathroom access and transferring. The Air Carrier Access Act, I want to start with here because I think it's important that we, we know our rights as a traveler with specific mobility needs. So the Air Carrier Access Act was developed in 1986. So clearly could, could use a little updating, but it's what we have right now. It prevents discrimination of people with disabilities by airlines that begin or end within the United States and its territories. Um, so airlines cannot refuse air travel, ground transportation, or terminal use for individuals with uh, mobility limitations. However, as I noted on here, they cannot limit the number of people with disabilities on a flight, but they can refuse the number of travelers with mobility limitations for safety reasons. But they do have to give you approximately 10 days notice if for some reason there's more than one individual with mobility um, challenges on a particular flight. So the airline has some responsibility on their end as well. 
a medical certificate. We like to tell people to have a medical certificate. Um, even though the Air Care Access Act says that it's not necessary unless you're traveling with um, oxygen, a ventilator, any type of extensive medical equipment, um, we encourage people to still have that note from your physician and that um, recommendation available to you. Um, advanced notice. Advanced notice, we recommend that people arrive at least one hour prior to their flight. Nowadays, with security, as you all may be aware, um, we recommend to our, our patients to arrive at least two hours, if not slightly longer. Um, better to be safe than sorry. Also, advance notice, uh, they require 48 hours. Most airlines do. Advance notice for transporting a power wheelchair on a flight with less than 60 seats. So that 60 seats will have some relevance as we continue on through um, what you need to know when you travel with air. Similarly, uh, battery power for a wheelchair, if you are going to transport a power wheelchair, they have to have advance notice for that as well. The air travel, some additional information about Air Carrier Access Act. There are safety um, assistance that are available. So um, in situations, for example, when a passenger is unable to evacuate safely or they just need uh, extra assistance on the flight, the airline may assign an off-duty personnel uh, to help you which is great. However, they will charge a fee for that. Um, similarly, they will also charge a fee for um, if you might need an extra seat, if your condition requires you to uh, have space beyond just one particular seat, they can also charge you for that, charge you for oxygen. So there may be some additional fees to expect if, if you need some special circumstances. Um, waivers of liability. Now, an airline cannot be required, cannot require you rather, to sign a waiver to be exempt from uh, wheelchair damage. So, however, they may require you to, to note if there's any particular damage that already exists. So don't bring your favorite, your best wheelchair <laughs> to the airport with you because it may or may not be in that same condition when you're finished. Just as brutal as they are to, to bags, they can be equally as brutal to wheelchairs. So just to be aware. Baggage liability limits do not apply to mobility equipment. So in other words, that uh, when you travel, for folks who have not traveled recently, you are allowed two carry-on pieces of luggage. So you are not required to include your mobility device, whether it be a walker or a wheelchair, in that too. So it's kind of good to know. Accessible lavatories are required on some airplanes, but not all airplanes. And they have to be above, uh, they have to have more than one aisle available in order to have an accessible lavatory. But I would recommend always calling the <coughs> airline to see if the particular plane that you will be flying on will have an accessible lavatory. But we'll talk more about those in an upcoming slide. And again, be aware of the seat with movable arm rests. So airport accessibility. So we have made our way through check-in, or I'm sorry, we've, we've talked about some general air carrier access, some general rights that we have as, as travelers. Now we're going to move on and talk about um, airport accessibility. So once you walk into the airport, the path between the gate, the boarding hour area, and actually throughout the entire airport should be accessible to you. However, if an airline only has kiosks, available for check-in and not true human people, they may not uh, be accessible. So just be aware of that. When I traveled recently, um, this, this was not my experience. There were, there were no accessible kiosks. So the proposed change by the Department of Transportation was back in September of 2011, but uh, it, has, it has yet to be fully enforced with all airports. Once you're checked in, you've got your boarding pass in hand. You're going to migrate your way to the Transportation Security Administration, as some like to call it, the Transportation Scary Administration. Um, what we know is that passengers with an assistive device or any type of adaptive equipment 
are not required to undergo special security procedures. So, however, the assistive devices, wheelchairs, walkers, um, walk aids, bionets, any, any type of AFO you might use, can be examined further to ensure that there are no explosives or prohibited items. So what may happen when you approach security, um, say, you ha say you have medications also. L let, me, let me talk about that as well. Say you have medications, your injectable medications, or you have medications that exceed the carry-on luggage recommended three ounces. Um, there is a particular lane that you will go in when you approach security. So tell the TSA representative when you hand them your boarding pass that you have uh, injectable medications, that you have liquids that exceed the, the three ounces. So tell them and they'll, they'll send you through a different lane and you may have additional screening of those liquids and of that medication. Again, having a physician note available during this process may help expedite it a bit. Same goes with cooling packs as well. Cool packs may um, be screened a little bit more extensively. But just remember at any point in time you can ask for a private screening. Airplane accessibility. Now, airplanes after 1992 are supposed to be more accessible. They're supposed to have movable armrests. They're supposed to have accessible laboratories. Now, supposed to is the key phrase in that. Um, airplanes with greater than 30 seats will have movable armrests, and a minimum of 50% of the aisle seats must have movable armrests. And this is equal proportion in first class as well as coach. So for example, if 50% of the coach seats have movable armrests, then 50% of the seats in first class should as well. As far as accessible laboratories, and we'll talk about this a little bit further in the presentation, airplanes with greater than one aisle must have that accessible laboratory. They must have that. Airplanes with one, only one aisle, this is optional. So, um, if there is not an accessible laboratory present, then an onboard wheelchair is an absolute must. Finding out what type of plane you're on is absolutely critical. Okay, so now that we're on the plane, how are we going to get around? Onboard wheelchairs. 48-hour um, advance notice. So that 48 hours is a pretty key time frame to give the airline advance notice about a special need you may have. Um, but that does vary per airline, so I would encourage you to contact your airline directly. Um, there is a passenger wheelchair storage unit available that allows one wheelchair per plane, and this is in airplanes for greater than one seat. So if you contact your airline and there's more than one individual using a personal wheelchair on the flight, then this this may be discussed and you may have to store your wheelchair or the other individual may have to store their wheelchair in another place. Um, your wheelchair, walker, any type of assistive device cannot be stored in an overhead compartment. But certainly identify your, your needs for accommodation within 24 hours on this, but I would, I would recommend even 48 hours for additional, additional notice. I love this website. If you have MS and if you don't have MS, this website is phenomenal as far as giving you specific seat dimensions for airlines and, air, and different airplanes you can ride on. So you can enter the specific air, air, excuse me, airplane that you'll be on and the specific airline and find out the dimensions of your seat. And that's seatguru.com, all the information you can imagine. Um, and it also helps with selecting a seat as some airlines now allow you to select your seat. So this is a picture of an onboard wheelchair. I'm going to get a note here if I can. An onboard wheelchair. The onboard wheelchair is about has to fit within the aisle, so it's about 17 inches diameter, so not very wide. So be aware of that. If you need to use that, it's not very wide. Seat dimensions of the seat that you will have the opportunity to sit in, on average, and this can vary depending upon the airline, from 17 to 22 inches, and that's from armrest to armrest. And as far as 
kind of back to knee space that you might have, you can have anywhere from 30 to 32 inches. So again, not a whole lot of room, but, but what I would encourage you guys to do is use these dimensions to practice transfers, to practice mobility in a confined space with your physical therapist, with your occupational therapist, so you can feel prepared for venturing on that, on that airline. This is one of my favorite pictures. These are two pictures of the inside of a lavatory or of an onboard restroom of an airplane. Clearly not a lot of space. The top picture is the interior. The lower picture is what it looks like if you were just to extract just the lavatory itself. So it looks like a little space shuttle, but it's not a lot of room for folks. Um, the average dimensions of an accessible laboratory is 23 inches in front of the toilet. So once you enter, the doorway is 23 inches itself wide. So it does accommodate the onboard wheelchair, but not a lot of wiggle room. And then 21 inches on each side of the toilet. So you can usually get in and pivot around on the wheelchair, and that's about all the more movement that's allowed. Um, Considerable variability in what's defined, of an, uh, defined as an accessible laboratory. Um, accessible laboratories are technically required in aer airplanes greater than 60 seats. However, there is no standard that exists at this time. The Oregon State University group is working to standardize both, na both nationally and internationally what's required as far as um, airport laboratory, or excuse me, airline laboratory accessibility requirements. So, Look forward to seeing those in the future. Boarding and deplaning services to and from the ticket counter, to and from the gate, to and from the restroom. In other words, you can have um, assistance as much as you need from the airport and from the airline themselves. They must provide assistance to and from the restroom um, using the onboard wheelchair while in flight. Use of wheelchairs, walkers, canes, and crutches are not considered a part of the carry-on luggage, and they can be stored, um, stored wherever the uh, flight attendants require you to store them. So expect to use pre-boarding. If you don't use pre-boarding, then you cannot be guaranteed a place to store your devices. This is a, certainly a first-come, first-serve basis. So I'm going to hand it over to Linda. Okay. Um, and we're going to now take a few minutes to talk about CARS, um, if this is what will work for your travel plans. Um, I will begin with the advantages of driving. Um, with the using your own car, you have the car adaptations that work for you. Um, they, that might be hand controls, that might mean ramps into the car or lifts on the back of the car for your scooter, your chair. Um, the advantage of driving is you can adjust your schedule to your needs. If, if sitting for more than two hours gets to be too uncomfortable, you can stop. If you enjoy sitting and want to be able to go for longer, the schedule is yours to make. Um, with cars, there's no restrictions on what uh, you want to bring or how much you want to bring, uh, um, except, of course, how much fits into your car. Um, so if you um, are, want to bring along extra clothing or extra items, you don't have to worry about your two-bag limit. Um, and if you want to bring cold drinks so that you have access to that continuously, that's definitely available when you're driving your own car. Also, the advantages of driving your car is you can stop and enjoy the sights along the way. The disadvantages of using your car, and those would be the unexpected. Um, obviously, none of us expect our car to have maintenance issues, especially not when we're trying to go on vacation or travel. However, those things do happen. Not only that, but when you're traveling and going further distances, you may not know the traffic patterns of that area. You may, so you will need to factor in additional time to make sure you either avoid rush hour or 
um, factor in extra time should you run into some kind of delay. I do want to briefly talk about rental cars. Um, I want to say that major rental car companies have made accommodations. They do have accessible features to them. One feature, the hand controls, are quite common amongst some of your major car rental um, companies. Again, you will need to make this request when you're um, making your reservation for your car rental car. They also have steering wheel knobs um, so that you can have that added or a car with that feature on them. There are um, cars, vans out there with wheelchair ramps um, to make that an easier part. The wheelchair ramps, however, I will say vary from city to city and from car rental uh, company to car rental company, even though I um, took these pictures and saw these experiences with one particular company that was in my area, that doesn't mean that when you book your travel to Tucson, Arizona, that budget cars in Tucson are they going to be the same as budget cars in Baltimore, Maryland. So again, um, you want to think about what your needs are and check to make sure that the company that you choose to rent from has those um, accessible features. Um, the next suggestion on ways to travel would be an RV. Um, obviously, the advantages for an RV is um, you feel at home. This is um, if you have an RV, it's avail and if you don't have one, that's okay too because RVs are available to rent, so you can always rent one and get this experience. Um, the advantage to an RV is just like the car, you're on your own schedule, um, you can set your own pace, and um, so let's go on to the next slide, which actually I listed out the RV advantages. Um, you don't have to pay for hotel. You make your own schedule, make your own meals. Um, the comforts of home are right there with you. Obviously, just with everything, there's also disadvantages. Um, to begin, you definitely need somebody who's comfortable driving a very large vehicle. This is something that's very different than just uh, a minivan, and so you want to make sure that the driver is comfortable before you start on a long excursion. Then the other disadvantages is even though you don't have to pay for hotels, you will have um, to pay for places where you stop and park, um, whether they be campgrounds or similar type facilities, and you do need to t factor in the cost of fuel. RVs, um, some of the really nice RVs are not what I would consider fuel efficient. And so even though you're, um, you have definite advantages, you will have increased costs um, for fuel. And on to train travel. Thanks, Linda. So you also have the option in addition to airline travel or traveling by car or RV, you can travel by train. So the good old Amtrak is always available and actually quite convenient in some cities. You can make your reservations online via the telephone or at a nearby ticket counter. Um, when you do make your reservation, we would encourage you guys to tell them if you need a wheelchair space, if you need an accessible transfer seat, or you need an accessible bedroom. An accessible or a transfer seat is a seat that you would be in when, you're in your, when your wheelchair is stowed, and stowed away and what you would be in while you are in, in, the, in the train itself. So. So making reservations, there are accessible bedrooms available to you on the Amtrak. You just have to let the reservation specialist know 14 days prior to departure. If you wait till closer to your travel date within that two-week mark, that becomes available to all passengers, that particular bedroom does. But prior to 14 days, it's available for only passengers with re reduced mobility. 
You must self-certify the need for accommodations with the conductor once you arrive. The nice perk of it is there is a 15% discount to passengers with mobility limitations and their travel companion. So kind of a perk. Um, you have to again verify that you are an individual with a disability or with a mobility limitation using a transit system ID card, a physician letter, a membership card from a, some type of organization. So the National MS Society would be sufficient for this purpose. So once you've made your reservation, you decided you're going to take the train, how accessible is the station? So you can identify your station accessibility by going to Amtrak.com, click on Find Your Station. You will have assistance available to you um, from Amtrak personnel if you request that during your reservation. So they can help you get on and off the, the train. Wheelchairs are available on site. You don't have to provide your own. But they do again recommend a one hour arrival prior to departure to make these arrangements. Train travel aids. Now unlike plane travel where the flight attendants will help you in Using the, the onboard wheelchair, they'll help you to the restroom. They won't help you in the restroom, but they'll help you to the restroom. Um, there is no aid on the Amtrak. So the Amtrak is not required and will not provide assistance to travelers with mobility issues once you're on board. So they'll help you get on, but they won't help you once you're on. And if you aren't able to, to take care of yourself once you're on the, the train, then you may be asked to deboard. So this is why they also provide the 15% discount to the travel companion in addition to the traveler. So if you are a wheelchair user and you are boarding a, a train, rather high platform boarding, you'll bridge, you'll board with a gap with a plate, which is which, what's pictured with this gentleman. A low platform boarding, you may be required to get on a lift and then lifted to the train itself, and then bi-level trains have ramps available to you. So, so there is some variability in, in boarding. Here are some lovely images of an accessible bathroom and bedroom, much more generous than the, than the plane, I would argue. So as you can see, as you can see, you have adequate space. I don't know if you can see that there with my marking. You have adequate space to pivot within a wheelchair. You have adequate space for a four-wheeled walker even, which is, is phenomenal. So lots of space in the accessible bathroom and bedroom. And this gal in this other picture seems to be enjoying herself nicely in her accessible bedroom. So some details about the accessible bedroom. There is adequate space for a wheelchair, two facing reclining seats. There is an upper level and a lower level, so for your travel companion and for yourself. A sink, vanity, the toilet, everything is accessible, including elevated toilet seats, grab bars, etc. Separated with a privacy curtain, so you do have that option for some privacy. Um, space for two suitcases. And again, I decided to list the, the dimensions for you. So Again, the opportunity to practice and plan with your therapist. We can't emphasize enough that uh, during this entire presentation that planning and anticipating the challenges you may have will help make travel more manageable for, for you and for everyone, regardless of MS. Wheelchair users with train travel. You can use your power wheelchair or manual wheelchair on the train, or you can transfer to a seat and the wheelchair will be still near, stowed nearby. Now if you do decide to stay in your own personal wheelchair during the trip, there are no lock, or I'm sorry, there are no tie downs available on the train, so you're required to use locks, you're required to use brakes, whatever you need to secure your wheelchair. Again, the requirements for the wheelchair are indicated there. Most standard wheelchairs, power wheelchairs, um, scooters fall within these requirements. So I, I don't anticipate anyone would have a huge concern um, fitting those requirements to uh, to travel on the train. And I'm going to pass the baton back to Linda to talk about boats and cruises. Okay. Um, the next area we're going to consider is um, boats and, or as 
boats as a mean of travel, but tr- a cruise may be your form of um, entertainment or uh, experience that you're looking for. Um, obviously, the one problem is not all of us live on the coast, and so the ease to get to a port of departure um, can be part of the challenge of your travel. However, um, cruises are a very nice option to start your exploration and, and travel goals. The enjoyment um, of a cruise is that you are seeing places and sites with your moving hotel. So you don't ever, once you get there and settle in, you don't really need to move in and out of facilities um, as you experience things because your hotel is moving. Um, Most cruise lines have handicapped accessible rooms. As pictured here, they usually have plenty of room. Uh, Obviously, depending on what room you pick will determine what your view is. Um, Again, cruises, the advantages are they provide meals, they provide activities, they provide entertainment, and it's all in one place. In general, um, the entire boat is usually um, accessible, um, and you... Uh, the one thing, though, you do need to remember is it is a boat, and for some people, seasickness is an issue, and so you do need to uh, plan ahead or maybe take just, again, something small to make sure that you're not the person that um, is very susceptible to uh, seasickness. Cruises, if you like the idea of cruises, Um, I encourage you to check the resources and read the reviews because each cruise line can be different. Some are much more accessible than others. Some, um, and there's actually a lot of really nice um, websites out there that specifically evaluate and provide recommendations um, for cruising for people with a disability. And so I've included both of those websites, and I encourage you, if that's um, the direction you may want to go in, to look and read and see what um, experienced people have to say. Okay. Um, Do you want me to read the questions, Mel? I can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, either one of you, and I'll... um show the results on the screen. Great. So what are the main barriers that now that we've kind of gotten a little bit past our halfway point, what are the main barriers that limit your travel? Uncertainty of transportation, mobility barriers, personal or medication needs, discomfort or fatigue, or have we addressed everyone's concerns and you feel much more competent to to set out on a voyage? Interesting. Yeah, I think that's I think all the results are up on screen. Um I, I do want to take a moment. Um we will since um fatigue and discomfort seem to be um a high uh barrier, we are uh, trying to address some of those indirectly um, regarding fatigue in terms of planning ahead and in, and factoring in what components you need to consider. However, I will also um, put a suggestion in that there is a whole separate webinar archived on the MS Can Do site that addresses purely management of fatigue. Great. Thank you. Okay, Um, I'm going to take a moment now to go on to buses. I've included um, a picture here because I do want to, there are definite advantages and disadvantages to buses. However, I will say that um, public transportation buses, buses like that are here for your sightseeing pleasure of New York City, these are what's considered a public transportation, and these are under requirements to be um, wheelchair accessible or handicapped accessible. However, I will mention that 
that individual tour buses are not under that same requirement. Just to go um, over some of the advantages to buses, it makes it easy for you to join a group, get involved in a group adventure. You do not have to deal with the, the stress of driving. There is an organized itinerary, which then will allow you to plan your needs and your rest based on the itinerary that um, the different tours may um, be offering. Um, and also the advantages to buses is sometimes they're a little bit easier to access from where you live since they're all over the place. It's not like a cruise ship where you have to get to the coast or where there's a port of departure. Unfortunately, there are disadvantages. Um, as I mentioned before, regular to um, bus tours on re um, that are not considered public transportation are not necessarily accessible. They, um, you have steps to enter and exit that you would have to navigate each time you get on and off, whether that's just for a rest stop or um, to get on and off for the, the actual tour. Um, the lifts that are out there in buses are usually in public transportation. As I mentioned, there are some exceptions, but for the most part you do need to take this into consideration that you will have to manage steps. Um, the other thing is bathroom stops are sort of um, controlled by the tour, not necessarily what might fit your schedule. There are bathrooms on the tour buses. However, they are usually designed more for the emergency. Um, and if you're comfortable going um, using them, that's okay because they, that's what they're there for. Um, however, I wouldn't say that they are necessarily going to be as accessible as a standard accessible bathroom would be. Um, another disadvantage is your walker would probably be stored underneath, which means that you're limited to getting, getting it in and out. If you're with a travel companion who can get it and bring it to you as you get off the bus, that's ideal. However, um, the bus driver may or may not um, be able to quickly get what you need, your uh, walker or whatever, from underneath the bus. So those are the factors you need to discuss with a particular tour line that you're going with. Um, rest stops, the, another disadvantage is rest stops are on a timeline. There is some reduced flexibility, however, um, in some senses, if you are feeling fatigued and you do want to just rest and you don't want to do some of the smaller excursions or some of the smaller stops, a lot of the major tour lines um, do accommodate for that. I am also including a, another reference definitely that talks about um, using buses at, for the disabled traveler. Um, okay. So now we've talked about the where, where you might want to go. We've talked about how, how you may get there, your different modes of transportation. And now it, we want to um, talk about the what. What about? There's lots of little extras that always seem to come up as you start thinking about travel plans. Some of these may include your personal needs, your, the accessibility of places, how you manage your medications, and mobility once you get to where you're going. Um, first, we're going to talk about your personal needs, fatigue management. Fatigue management can limit the activities that you participate in, in a day-to-day -day or over the course of several days. You need to take a look at how you manage your fatigue, what um, techniques work best for you, whether that means a daily um, uh, rest stop where your legs are elevated or a 15-minute nap. And you need to take that into consideration as you look at um, planning out your travel. Mobility, are you going to take a walker? Are you going to take a wheelchair? Do you want to, when you get there, have a scooter rented to make it easier? Or even a wheelchair um, that rented so that once you arrive at where you're going, um, you have extra um, support so that you can be more involved even though your walking stamina may not be 
um, able to keep up, if you have a wheelchair available to you, that will increase your ability to be involved. Um, I also included some pictures of some personal equipment that might help you maintain your independence. Um, a leg lifter. Beds can be different heights, heights that are not um, not what you're used to. You may have a certain technique that you're used to using at home. So this, these pieces of equipment may help you overcome some of those um, small things that might get in the way. Think of your personal accessibility needs. Um, when you call for hotel reservations, make sure you ask for an accessible room. Um, do you need bathroom equipment? Do you need to make sure that they have safety bars in the tub? Um, do they have a shower seat? Um, you might even want to be specific and ask for the size of the room, the size of the bathroom, so that you know whether um, you, can, you need to practice um, some different types of transfers or whether you'll be, have enough room to be independent. Um, you definitely want to check in your room and ask if they have a refrigerator. Um, not, many of us are used to refrigerators always been, being in a room. However, you should never make the assumption and definitely ask. Um, even if it's not in, a lot of times a hotel will have it available if you make the request. Um, and then remember to bring your equipment, as I mentioned before, the leg lifter or the reacher. These little extra pieces of equipment can definitely help you be more independent within your room, with, which may be a, a different environment that you're used to. Where will you stay and things to consider? For instance, medications. Do you need a refrigerator? Um, make sure you ask the hotel if it's available or if it's in the room or do you need to have one put into the room? You also, when you're traveling, want to think about how your medications impact your energy levels. So if um, you are fatigued after your medication, maybe you want to make sure or check with your physician and see if you can slowly adjust your schedule so that it works with the schedule of um, the cruise that you're on or the um, tour that you're on where dinner may be at a different time than you're used to. Um, remember, most importantly, is extra time before and after you take your medicines, um, extra time to get to where you're going, um, extra time to allow yourself to not be hurried and not be stressed. Um, you want to also think about extra fluids. Um, if you're taking medications in the evening, are there extra fluids, um, water that you can take back to your room, juices to keep in your room, um, anything to increase your comfort level. Um, so it's important for you to think about what you normally have and what you um, would benefit from having when you're traveling. Thanks, Linda. We're going to go ahead and start to recap a little bit. Some general tips for all travel. Um, it's important to have that note from the physician stating that you have MS. If you don't <coughs> want to disclose that you have MS, um, just, just indicating that you have some mobility limitations will be quite helpful when you travel. Physicians page your telephone numbers indicating devices and medications that may be in your bag, and that will help to avoid extra security questioning if you just disclose those up front. Linda's talked a lot about pacing. Pacing is important. Be cognizant of how you feel, especially on those travel days. As traveling can be exhausting without MS, it can be especially exhausting with MS. So allowing in your schedule an extra day of rest or building rest into your schedule, perhaps a longer layover, may be a valuable tool for you. Remember your cooling vests and your cooling devices, if that's appropriate for you. Um, consider having them shipped. Um, often if you ship them, they can be there when you arrive, and, and they can be shipped back to you when you're finished with your, your trip as well. And lastly, consider travel insurance. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, in the unfortunate event of an exacerbation or any type of other travel complication, have that insurance uh, available. It's, it's a small price to pay for peace of mind. Some more general tips is use the manual wheelchairs. Use the transport chairs, especially for air travel. And you can rent power wheelchairs and scooters 
at the destination, and we'll talk about some resources for that in the upcoming slides. Um, again, airlines can be very hard on wheelchairs just as they're very hard on luggage. So, so be cognizant of, of your needs as far as mobility once you're at the airport. Um, some travel agencies. Uh, one is www.abletotravel.org. Let those travel agencies do the work for you. They are the experts. So consider, consider them as a resource. Um, another one for mobility equipment rentals is scootaround.com. This is a nationwide um, mobility equipment rental service. So you can rent scooters, power wheelchairs. Um, I listed the average cost estimate for one week for a power chair, $225. For a scooter, $200. They'll deliver to the residence or to your hotel or wherever you wish. So pretty convenient resource. Um, and again, if you have used canes perhaps for mobility, uh, consider the fold-up canes that fit in luggage carry-ons um, a lot easier than carrying in a cane uh, around with you, especially if you don't need it at that moment in time. Some more resources for mobility equipment rentals, uh, abletotravel.org, and then special needs at and that's actually .com. I apologize for that. It's specialneedsatsea.com rather than .org. But again, more resources for um, accessible vacation arrangements, travel agents, and equipment. And resources for accessible ground transportation. And Linda had spoke about this earlier. But wheelchairgetaways.com is a site that you can rent Vans. You can rent wheelchair accessible vans. You can um, cars, anything that you might need to help you get around once you've arrived at your destination. Insurance may help cover the cost of the accessible vehicle renter. I was surprised by this. So um, talk with your insurance provider before this. This was quoted to me via one of the representatives from Wheelchair Getaway. So double check that. So in summary, planning for travel is success with travel. Um, we've discussed today the where, where you might want to go, how you can get there, planes, trains, automobiles, buses, cruises, and what you might need to, to be prepared for your trip. What we do want to, to, to encourage and make you aware is that regardless of MS or not, travel comes with its own set of adventures. We encourage planning but also patience and flexibility because the unexpected can, can always occur when it comes to traveling. More importantly, we also encourage you to enjoy not just the destination that you're headed to but also enjoy your journey. Here are some more references available to you. And now we'll entertain any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you for your attention. That was great, ladies. Thank you so much. Um, before we got into the Q&A, I noticed a few people put um, some suggestions on the national parks um, with having, a, I guess, a pass of sorts for those that um, travel with a disability and attending the park for free um, or getting into the park for free. So that might be another option for travel within the U.S. for individuals. Um, we've got some great questions here, and feel free to jump in, ladies, um, again, um, with any answers that you have. Um, the first one that I am seeing here is um, getting on an airplane or going through security with needles. Um, suggestions for that with getting through security. And are there also any suggestions for storage and safety while traveling? I'll go ahead and take this one. So storage and safety uh, in reference to, I'm going to assume that that means in reference to storage and safety of your mobility equipment in the airport. If that's correct, then um, what I would encourage you is just keep that on you. Use a backpack. Use some type of, um, usually you can uh, have a backpack that can be used with a, or even a cooler, a backpack or a backpack that has a cooling feature to it. Uh, to store your medications and store your injectables. And I would just keep that on your person at all times. Okay. Uh, another question I have here is going back earlier to the ref um, waiver of liability and with air travel, um, does it apply to someone 
with a rolling walker, and um, I guess this is a two-part, um, are there luggage fees for bringing the walker on board? I guess would they be charged additional or would it be considered a carry-on? They, great question. That should not be considered a carry-on. That is a part of your person and you should not be charged additional fees per the, per the act that we talked about, the Air Carrier Access Act. So you should not be traveled or cost, uh, charged additional fees. Excuse me. I would, as we said with everything though, I'd also make sure you say to the airline as you're booking your tickets, you know, confirm all this information, let them know. Because the more you let them know, the more informed you are. That's a good suggestion. Uh, I, another question I have here is um, an MSID card. Um, I don't know if there's a, a type of ID card that would help with traveling, and I, I don't know if that would help with going through security. Um, not quite sure what that refers to, but is it something that you all have heard of? I personally don't know of that. Um, however, you know, any kind of verification from a physician that you are a person with a disability, um, whether it's, I would just make sure it's recent and it's it's dated so that you know nobody can question um, the validity of of you know the, that you definitely qualify for accommodations. I'm sure. And uh, another question that I have here, um, and what do you do if the bed in your motel room is too high? And I think this person was referring to a situation where uh, maybe there isn't an accessible room available and they're in the situation with trying to figure out how to um, deal with that, that situation. Um, Mandy, do you have any specifics that you sure, are thinking? So I want to make sure I understand the question correctly. It's the, the bed was too high. How can, how can we ad adapt to that situation? I would go back and request and see if there's an accessible bedroom. If that's not in the, in the cards, then I would demand <laughs> I would be a bit of a nuisance, and I would demand that the, someone's available then to assist you in and out of the, the bed or provide you the tools, whether it be a, an extra step or a lift of sorts, get in and out of the bed. Great. Thank you so much. Um, another question here, um, and this is someone going to the beach. Um, are there options for negotiating the sand? Um, I don't know if they meant specifically a wheelchair or in a walker, but um, are there any adaptable options for someone who wants to go and enjoy the, the beach and get through the sand? <laughs> um, I don't know if you had any personal, personal experience, Mandy. I know I have seen um, wheelchairs that have these huge wheels that are designed to be able to accommodate. However, I have never, I've seen them available. I don't know if that means they're available for rental or not. Um, and they are rather pricey. Um, so I guess it depends on how much of an experience um, in the sand you want to get as to whether you want to make that investment. That's, I agree with you, Linda. That's been my experience as well. They have the larger the larger wheels, um, and then if you're somebody who's ambulatory, I would consider certainly uh, using, uh, you know, a walk aid or an AFO or some type of um, device to help you to help you make your way easier through the sand, and even use a walker as well. Um, those would be my recommendations. Yeah. Great, and I saw one of you answered this in the chat, but I just wanted to revisit um, shipping medications ahead of time. Um, and this person referred to a, a shorter trip, but would that be beneficial also for a longer trip as well? I'll, I'll comment on this one first, Linda, and then I'll let you chime in. I would be hesitant shipping all of your medications. Keep some with you just in case if you're on air travel and you get stranded somewhere. You have to spend the night in an airport. You don't want to be without your medications. However, certainly sending a few ahead of time may, may save you some money. 
um, because of the shipping fees and the baggage fees that are required nowadays. But if your medication needs to be cooled, then that should stay on your person the whole time or shipped on dry ice. So something to keep in mind. Great. Um, and this is, I know you had um, references for um, sites where you can get equipment. Um, do any of these specifically help with traveling overseas? Um, this person asked about Paris, Morocco. You know, it sounds like a world traveler, but uh, would these sites or is there, are there suggestions for assistance in that situation? Um, I can say yes, there are several. Um, the two books that I suggested do include some international traveling and um, active MSers. Um, I believe there was some international travel. Um, they may be very specific to what they've experienced um, on these different sites. However, they can at least give you ideas of how they managed and what they found available. Um, and I, I, I'm not coming, it's not coming to mind at the moment, but there is one of the websites that does go extensively into international. Um, it might be the Disabled Travelers guide.com, I, 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 and I could be wrong, it might be the, um, a different one, but on, the, on the, um, one of the first slides where I listed several um, travel agents and knowledgeable, um, one of those sites did go into international travel a lot, reviewing what was out there. Great. Um, I think we have time for one last one. Um, this is um, flying and um, asking for an aisle seat. Um, is someone able to avoid the charge, um, the extra charge, because they now ask you if you'd like, I guess they consider it an upgrade, but um, avoiding an extra charge for asking for the accommodations, or would you suggest talking with the airline? That's a great question, and um, I would encourage you to chat with the airline because I'm suspecting that may vary from airline to airline since not all airlines um, charge for an additional upcharge for an aisle seat. So I would certainly chat with your airline about that. Great question. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And this has been a great presentation and we've gotten some great questions from the audience. And I wanted to thank Mandy and Linda and also everyone who joined us this evening for the webinar. Um, the next webinar is going to be on July the 10th at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and the topic will be Cognitive Changes. And we have a new format now for our webinars. Uh, we'll have two to three experts present. There's one topic for discussion and no charge to you. So please join us live from the convenience of your home or office at no charge for an in-depth discussion on topics relating to exercise, nutrition, communication, symptom management, and total health. This unique webinar series will provide insight from more than one MS expert so you can gain additional knowledge relating to multiple sclerosis. Interact with our team of can-do MS consultants, ask questions, and learn how to adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors, actively co-manage your MS, and live your best life. You can register for this and other webinars at www.mscando.org. And for those participating live this evening, as soon as the presentation is over, you will see a survey appear on your computer screen. Please take a moment to complete the survey and help us to continue our webinars. We value your feedback and your input. And you'll also receive an email with a copy of the slides as well. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening.